Thanks everybody who made it back out after the after party last night. I know it was a late night for some people. Um, yesterday was a huge success. We had uh, about 1,000 in-person attendees and close to 8,000 um, who tuned in for the live stream. Uh, so today is gonna be very similar to yesterday. We've got uh, panels and uh, speakers, um, but one thing that we're doing that's a, a slightly different today is we have a pitch competition, which will happen at 1 p.m. in the Nakamoto room, and then uh, at 5 p.m. today, we'll announce the results of the pitch competition and the hackathon, which has been going on all weekend. Uh, so looking forward to all of that. Uh, and last thing, happy Mother's Day to Nancy Keshin and all of the other mothers out there. If your mother's not with us <laughs> at the expo, uh, make sure to wish her well today. Um, all right, so I'm gonna turn it over to my co-director, uh, Gabriel Pasquale, for our first fireside chat today. <laughs> All right, well, let me introduce our first speaker, everyone. Uh, online with us, we have Sam Bakeman fried He's become one of the most well-known faces and recognized names in crypto as the CEO of the exchange FTX and the trading firm Alameda Research. Before founding FTX, Sam was a trader on Jane Street Capital's international ETF desk. He traded a variety of ETFs, futures, currencies, and equities, and designed their automated OTC trading system. He graduated from MIT with a degree in, in physics. Welcome back, Sam. Thanks. So I'd love to jump right into it. You started FTX in, in 2019, so I was hoping you could bring us along on your journey. Maybe tell the crowd what is FTX and, and what led you to create it. Yeah, so uh, FTX, it's a global cryptocurrency exchange. Um, I, you know, there's something like uh, two billion dollars, or sorry, fifteen billion dollars that they trade uh, daily on, on FTX um, uh, as as of now, and uh, you know, how did, you know, how did I get here? Well, I was, I was at MIT and had just realized I did not want to become an academic. And I had no idea what I did want to do with my life. Um, started getting into effective altruism and thinking about um, how I could have, you know, the largest possible uh, positive impact on the world, um, which you know, led me to uh, thinking about how I could donate as much money as I could uh, to effective charities. Um, I had some friends who had uh, worked on Wall Street and enjoyed it. And so, you know, decided to, uh, to try that out. So I, I interned at Jane Street Capital, a, a quant firm, um, after my junior year, liked it, I ended up there. Um, and I you know, was, was working there, trading and donating most of what I made. Um, and that's sort of what I thought I was going to end up doing with my life. Um, it was an incredibly good position. Um, I had a great time there. I learned a ton. Um, eventually, I sort of, um, you know, came uh, to the conclusion that there were a lot of things I wanted to try doing with my life. And there was no way to, uh, I, to, to do that without uh, leaving. And so I, I left Jane Street in 2017. And I, uh, I, you know, didn't know exactly what I would end up doing. Um, ended up uh, getting into crypto because there was really good trading to do there at the time. And after a year or so of that started up FTX. Awesome. Well, I have a few EA questions for you at the end, um, but before that, could you tell us a little bit about what's important in an exchange and maybe how did FTX differentiate, it, uh, differentiate itself early on, given that it started in 2019? Yeah, so I, you know, the core of an exchange is actually pretty simple. Um, it's a matching engine. Uh, it's a place where people can submit bids and offers for an asset, and those will trade with each other. Um, and that core piece of technology is actually not that complicated, all things considered. Um, there are complicated parts when you start adding more onto it. Um, and so now you can ask, well, what is FTX then, or what is a modern crypto exchange? If a exchange at its heart is, is a pretty simple concept. And the answer is it's a full stack financial product. Um, and so on FTX, you do everything from deposit, uh, you know, fiat currencies or cryptocurrencies um, to, um, I, I, to I, you know, having the matching engine there where you can submit orders, 
account management there. It custodies the assets, clears them. Um, it has a risk engine in the back, uh, a compliance engine built out in-house. And so in the end, um, it, it's actually like everything that you need um, in order to complete a, a cryptocurrency trade. And you know, in fact, in most trades in crypto, the only people involved are the buyer, the seller, and the exchange. Um, and that is very different from what you see in traditional finance, where exchanges are just one piece of a much larger ecosystem, and that whole stock is actually split up between um, all of those different parties. I, the reason that ultimately, you know, we ended up starting FTX, basically, we were really frustrated with the performance of the other exchanges, and um, it led us to think that there is a big opening in, in trying to, to, to build a new one despite the fact that we were pretty late to the game and that was gonna make it really, really hard to acquire users. Um, hard enough that our guess was that we were gonna fail. Really interesting. So I know one of the, <clears throat> one of the initial offerings of FTX was uh, a heavy focus on derivatives, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. Yep. Um, I was hoping, I, uh, Ryan Miller was with us yesterday from FTX US, and he touched on a little bit that most of the derivatives tra trading happens outside the US. I know that FTX recently acquired LedgerX, which came with a few licenses, but that you guys are in the process of modifying those licenses. Can you tell us why? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, right now, 95% of volume is outside of the US, and almost all futures volume is outside of the US. And the reason basically um, is that. Uh, you need a license from the CFTC in order to offer uh, futures in the US. And, and basically, no one has that in the crypto ecosystem today. Um, and so because of that, uh, you know, you see most of the volume, most of the liquidity going up offshore. Um, LedgerX, um, now FTX US Derivatives, um, is a CFTC licensed uh, derivatives exchange, which can, in theory, offer uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum futures in the United States. Um, however, right now, um, you can't offer any margin or leverage or financing on them. And so it, it's, it's actually not that different from a spot contract. And the amendment that we have before the CFTC right now um, is to be able to offer leverage like every other uh, you know, major futures exchange does and like we do internationally. Awesome. So I want to jump to a little bit of kind of the macro perspective that you have on the cryptocurrency market. Um, you at FTX have a really interesting and unique perspective because you see both the, the OTC side as well as you know the order book for a massive exchange. Could you tell us a little bit about, about maybe what is OTC and um, oh, I'm sorry uh, for those of us that may not know, and then kind of how the asset classes have evolved from from your perspective? Yeah, totally. So you know OTC trades are over the counter trades. Those are are places where rather than going to an exchange and trading on an order book. Um, people will basically contact either a market maker directly or some liquidity pool um, uh, and uh, ask for a quote on you know, the trade that they ultimately want to do. And if that quote is good enough, then they'll do the trade. Um, and it, you know, it's something that tends to happen a lot more for, um, uh, for sort of large size trades from institutions, uh, whereas you, know, you tend to see order books used for smaller uh, I you know, more standard trades. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that in crypto, most of the volume uh, goes up lit, which is to say on exchanges. Um, that is a little bit different from what you see in some other asset classes, where a lot of the volume is going up on, uh, you know, various uh, dark pool-like venues or, or OTC venues. Um, I think this is probably a, a good thing about the crypto ecosystem. I think it promotes, you know, cleaner, more transparent markets um, to have that. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, you know, that, that sort of, you know, is where most of it goes up. Um, over the last, uh, you know, three years or so since we started FTX, the biggest change has been the massive increase in the amount of capital in crypto. Um, you can see this in much more liquid order books, you know, much higher volume, much more engagement, much more institutional engagement. Um, and I, you know, that has flowed through on the venture side, it's flowed through on the trading side, on the OTC side, on the liquidity side, and, and pretty much everything else. Awesome. And because this is the you know, MIT Bitcoin Expo, I guess a, a Bitcoin focused uh, question, what do you think the role of Bitcoin will ultimately serve in this space you know, over five, 10 years? 
Yeah, so you know, obviously, I don't know for sure. Um, all I can do is, is guess. Um, but you know, my best guess here um, is that Bitcoin is going to uh, you know serve a role most similar to you know something like digital gold, which is to say, you know, that it's going to be effectively a um, I, I, you know like um, a, a store of value, a thing that that you know especially internationally, uh, people will hold, especially if they don't have access. Um, to other uh, sort of good uh, safe stores of value, um, and uh, and less so as a means of payment itself, just given the capacity limitations of the Bitcoin network. Um, although you absolutely could see it, um, you know, wrapped into other blockchains or onto Lightning or or Layer Twos or something like that, um, in order to be used for payments. Okay. Awesome. So moving a little bit away from financial applications, you had a really interesting uh, uh, Twitter thread on a decentralized Twitter. And Twitter's on our mind. We had Tess Reinierson here yesterday, uh, the head of crypto at Twitter, um, and also with the acquisition of Twitter by Elon Musk. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about what your thoughts are on the recent acquisition of Twitter by Elon, um, and maybe speak a little bit to what your vision for a decentralized Twitter would be and how it would solve current moderation challenges. Totally. So, you know, obviously we'll see what happens, but I'm potentially pretty excited for what could happen there. I think it's very much a company that was in need of some, uh, you know, reinvigoration. And, you know, hopefully this will be, uh, you know, enough to to help provide that. Um, it, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's a, a company where, um, you know, there was not enough, uh, uh, you know, there's not enough innovation coming. And um, and where they're having serious issues with, um, you know, for instance, um, uh, moderation, uh, and at the same time having pretty significant cost overruns. Um, and you know, my sense for what would make sense here um, would be something like the following: um, you could um, put the actual underlying social media messages on a blockchain, and the advantage of the underlying you know, tweets and, and the advantage of doing this um, is I actually think there, there are a few different advantages. One of them is that it creates composability between social media networks, which is missing today. And I think is actually a pretty big problem. So right now, if you tweet um, and someone else is using Facebook, they can't see what you, you said. Um, and uh, similarly, if you're on Facebook and they're using WhatsApp, they can't see what you said. Um, and that's kind of dumb. It's a bad user experience. It means we all have to have 30 different apps. Um, it also means that there are gigantic moats getting in the way of new entrants coming into the space. Because if you wanted to, uh, you know, if your goal were to start up, uh, you know, your own social media network, it wouldn't have users, it wouldn't have messages. Um, if you put the actual messages on a blockchain, then, you know, any social media network could read from those messages. And they wouldn't be, you know, gated and restricted just to the social media network that they were originally, um, you know, uh, entered on, um, which would give a ton of flexibility and, and I think a ton of power. Um, I, and 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 it would mean that you know users could have a much more coherent, consistent experience. It means that if you want to start up your own social media network, you could compose with the existing blockchain layer for messages without having to worry about the network effect buildup. Um, and I, uh, you know, and so I think it'd be healthy from a co competitive uh, perspective and from user experience perspective. I would also let you have different experiences on different portals without losing that network effect. And so, you know, you could have, uh, you know, you, you could imagine having, you know, different moderation standards, for instance, on different front ends that all composed with that same underlying, underlying set of messages. So anyway, I think I think it'd be pretty cool. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if it's actually something Elon's going to do, but um, I, but, but I do think that there would be significant advantages to it. I think in in the thread you said something like, you know, if there's a need, we'll we'll help make it happen. How would you help make it happen? I, uh, yeah, I mean, I think like we would be super happy to help build out um, the actual infrastructure um, for it, and so you know, building out the um, I. I, you know, the protocols for, for posting them on, on, on blockchains um, and I, uh, you know, building out connectivity um, with, uh, you know, hosted sites and, um, 
uh, you know, in general, will be happy to run, you know, build out or and or run, uh, you know, the whole uh, blockchain based piece of that. Awesome. All right, jumping to my my questions on EA and the FTX Future Fund. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about what the F FTX Future Fund is first, and uh, what sort of initiatives within that fund you're, you're most excited about. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things that we're excited about, and it's somewhat intentionally taking a pretty broad view of what it could be, um, I, which I'm excited by as well. Um, I, but you know, I, I think some of the things we're seeing first, uh, we're seeing a lot of regranting based funding. And so some of this is finding people um, who have a track record of, of you know, doing great work and you know, giving them um, smaller pots of money to, uh, to, to, to donate. Um, I, you know, some of this is going towards pandemic preparedness and prevention, which I think is, is sorely needed. Um, some of this is going towards, you know, effective altruism movement building. Some of this is going uh, towards um, AI safety organizations. Um, some of it's going to global health and poverty or animal welfare organizations. You know, there, there are little bits going to a lot of different places. Um, uh, and, and I think we very much see this as a sort of like building out and trial phase for it. Um, you know, where ultimately we'll end up, you know, sizing up the things that, that we think are, are doing best. But, you know, we think we're probably going to do, um, I, you know, I, I think we've already done, frankly, uh, about 100 million this year so far of, of donations and, you know, looking to do more over the rest of the year. So, um, I, you know, hopefully, hopefully can get pretty big, hopefully can, can have a lot of positive impact. Great, great. So I... As you know, there's a there's a big EA community kind of across MIT, across Harvard. So I spoke to a few of those people and collected two questions for you from kind of the, the general EA community. The first one is, what are some of the things that the EA community should do differently? I mean, I think they should be way more ambitious. I think that like, you know, there are ways to have massively outsized impact and doing that is just worth so much. Um, that, uh, you know, that it, it's really worth prioritizing. And, and so I think that like, you know, whether that's thinking about ambitious um, ways to potentially be able to donate a huge amount of money, whether that's looking at projects that might be able to scale very large if they're doing well, whether that's, or whether that's looking at just scaling up a granting organization uh, to be able to do significant size. Um, you know, I think we've been undershooting. I think there are lots of signs we've been undershooting. I think we've been donating hundreds of millions of dollars a year as a community to things that uh, most of the people doing those donations, I think don't think are the best things out there um, because there hasn't been enough scaling in other uh, areas. Um, and I think that most of all, we should be willing to risk failure. Um, you know, if you're not willing to risk failure, you're just not gonna get um, the, the biggest upside pieces. And, um, you know, you can try and think about what you think these probability distributions look like. If you think they're very skewed, which I, Kind of think they do. Um, probably the best strategy has a pretty significant chance of failure, and that's okay. Um, especially as an individual, because what matters is aggregate impact. And um, you know, you're not trying to guarantee that you personally have at least some amount of impact. Um, and you're trying to maximize the impact of the community, and that is somewhat different. And and I think it pushes much much more in the direction of um, I, I you know of making sure that I that you're thinking about the expected value and the upside rather than making sure that you have at least some fixed level of impact. And then following up on that um, related to failure, do you think there are some problems that EA cannot solve? I mean, cannot is a strong word. Um, maybe should not be focusing on right now. Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I, I think that like, in theory, right, EA's goal is to do whatever has the largest impact. And so, you know, in theory, like it should be willing to take on whatever is important here and, you know, without restrictions. But um, I, but, you know, yeah, again, empirically, like there are things that probably aren't that thing. And so I, I, I you know, I think that you see that somewhat in the patterns that it has had. Um, but that, you know, I, I think one reason, for instance, that you know, EA has focused less on climate change um, than a lot of the world has, um, is uh, that I think there's been a perception of a lack of 
um, sort of effective, efficient scaling approaches to it. Now, I'm not sure that that's necessarily correct. And I think you could reasonably argue that maybe EA has been underestimating how much it could do um, in, 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 in fighting climate change. Maybe there are ambitious projects that could have really massive impact on it at a, a relatively uh, tractable uh, cost. And, and if so, that it would make sense to prioritize. And, and, and I, I think frankly that like things like that have generally been underdone in EA, taking something which is sort of like viewed for whatever reason is not super tractable. Um, and uh, seeing whether we're actually thinking uh, ambitiously about it or whether we're thinking, well, is it effective to take all our money and put it into like, you know, carbon offsets? Probably not. Um, like that's just not gonna be the best thing. In fact, anything that you've heard of and is well-funded is not gonna be the best thing because there's a trillion dollars right now trying to fight climate change, right? So if you're putting it at the same things that they are, those are not going to be nearly as neglected, but that doesn't mean that there aren't some really effective strategies. And like to give one example of this, and this is sort of the opposite of your question, right? But like even within a realm that I think traditionally, you know, EA has been less active in, I would be really excited to see someone do an actually deep, really principled dive on uh, geoengineering. And, you know, whether there are really, um, really powerful things that can be done there to fight climate change. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's sort of probably a few other types of interventions that have some chance of being massively valuable um, and take some amount of creativity and, and, and sort of going out on a limb, but absolutely should be done. So, you know, even within the places that, you know, yeah, that, that sort of like traditionally EA has avoided, um, I still think that like, it's not obvious that the movement has been making the right choice in that. Before we jump back to a few crypto or crypto related questions, what's the most ambitious project in the FTX Future Fund currently? Well, there are a lot of really ambitious projects that we've put out requests for. Um, and I, I think that like, you know, you can read the website and see a lot of, you know, a, a lot of things on a lot of scales. Like right now, in terms of things that have been actively deployed, um, I think the most ambitious one is the regrantor program, which is a sort of a bullshit answer because that, that's actually like a collection of projects. Um, but, I, I, but, 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 you know, it's basically I uh, saying, um, I, you know, like that we're going to be giving, you know, a, words of 100 million this year to uh, a lot of members of the community to give to where they think um, is most needed and most effective. And one thing that I really like about this vision, um, and, and one reason that I think we're sort of like drawn to it, um, is that it potentially gets large scale of really efficient opportunities that are hard to scale. And, and what I mean by this is that there's a lot of micro opportunities in the community that a ton of people notice. And you'll see all over the place and be like, oh boy, like if like this group had an extra $5,000, um, they could actually do something really great right now. They don't have it. And like, could they go apply to, you know, open fill or to future fund or something like that for a grant? They could, if it's gonna be a $5,000 grant, it's like, it's gonna be an enormous amount of hassle for that. Um, but if someone who's sort of related to that group um, is uh, is a regrantor, then uh, that changes the equation here and makes it so that you know they can potentially um, I you know come and uh, and fill that gap you know in in a really efficient way and 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 you know in theory this could be scaled to the point where actually you know what you end up with is um, uh, it is really like a lot of uh, pretty compelling opportunities for uh, you know adding up a thousand of those opportunities to create five million of incredibly effective giving, um, and and having a distribution mechanism that could plausibly scale that out. Awesome. Well, that's a, a great segue. It sounds like distribution of capital is important and access to financial services. So if yep. we jump to DeFi real quick from EA. Um, I would like I would love for you to tell us a little bit about the work that FTX has done on Serum. Um, and then I'd love to hear your perspective on kind of the coexistence of centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges. Uh, yeah. So, you know, what is Serum? It's a decentralized exchange on on you know Solana blockchain. 
And the theory was actually creating an exchange on chain, so, so a real DEX with an order book. And that sort of hadn't been done before. Um, you know, we'd seen DEXs and we'd seen centralized exchanges with order books. We basically hadn't seen a DEX with an order book. And I think order books are, are generally like the most uh, effective and efficient um, uh, form of, um, you know, of trading. And so I, I think there's a ton of value in this. Um, I, you know, in terms of centralized versus decentralized exchanges, there are some things that are just never going to make sense um, in the context of a decentralized exchange. Um, they are, among other things, um, they're just not the most I, I, computationally efficient things. Like it, it is, um, you know, an unfortunate property of them that they take a, uh, you know, at least thousands of times as much compute. You know, latency is not going to get below 100 milliseconds probably. And this isn't fatal. Um, it is fatal though for some things. It is fatal for some applications. And that's at its core, the way I think about it is like, well, you know, it's, um, I, that's totally fine from the perspective of someone swiping right on a retail app, right? Because that is something that like is not particularly, you know, time sensitive. It's not particularly, um, I, you know, latency sensitive. And so it's totally fine to have that, you know, on significant uh, lag, meaning 100 milliseconds of lag. That doesn't ruin the experience at all. When you have two high frequency trading firms that are trading with each other, like that, they're not going to want to pay a 20th of a penny and uh, eat a 150 millisecond lag on the trade. And so I basically think that there's just like some cases that it doesn't make sense for. But if you ignore those and just focus on the cases where it might make sense, um, you know, I then think it's, it, you know, that there are compelling reasons to at least try to put things on the blockchain. Um, I think that like, um, you know, it creates this sort of modular, modular you know, composable um, Lego brick style of building, which, which can be super powerful. Very interesting. So I was hoping you could dig in a little bit to the role of arbitrage in DeFi. And I guess, do you think it's, it's good? Uh, okay, arbitrage and do I think it's good? Um, I, um, I basically think that there are, are good and bad parts of it, but that at the end of the day, when all is said and done, your prior should probably be that it's good. Um, and the reason I say this um, is that I, you know, what? So what is arbitrage? It's you know, buying low, selling high at the same time. Um, making money doing it by doing arbitrage. Um, you know, let's say that, and I'll take maybe a, a more extreme case. Um, one of the biggest trades that I ever did was a uh, arb in Japan, um, where Japanese bitcoins were trading um, a whole lot higher than American bitcoins. Uh, they were trading about ten percent higher, and the trade there, which was a pretty straightforward trade, um, was I, uh, you know, buying uh, bitcoins. Um, in uh, uh, you know buying bitcoins in, in in America, sending them to Japan, selling there, and you know making making money doing that. One of the consequences of doing that, um, one, one of the advantages of, uh, of doing that for markets is well, you have all these people in Japan trying to buy bitcoins, getting a really bad price for it, right? And in fact, probably they just like can't join, can't buy more, uh, because if they did, there just like wouldn't be any sellers there eventually, right? Or the price would get so dislocated it would be absurd. And in general, that's like a breakdown of efficient markets, right? Like there are buyers and sellers who are trying to meet up and they're failing to, and that's going to stop trades from happening or at least stop them from happening at reasonable prices. And so what can you do about that? Well, uh, if you have an arbitrage firm come in there, um, I, it will bring those prices together and it will transport that liquidity from the United States to Japan. Um, and in doing so, uh, you know, make markets more efficient, more liquid, um, and, you know, probably in the end, uh, you know, end up helping out the consumer. And so that anyway, that, that, that's sort of my prior uh, on it. You know, if you don't have a particular reason to think in a particular case that, you know, it would be good or bad. And, um, and, and so that, that, that's, a, that's where I start coming from. And, you know, that, that's, I think, where I end up in, in most cases, unless there's sort of like some reason that it's, you know, particularly predatory or something like that. 
in a particular case that like this is an, a dumb arb that like you know was created by the person who's doing the arb or something like that like you know there was not a liquidity hole until someone created the liquidity hole in order to get to fill it um but as long as you don't have a case like that then then in general i think it, it's you know positive uh for the world for arbs to to be done there's an awesome video of you at alameda on uh, YouTube, I think from maybe 2019, uh, kind of yep. uh, <laughs> the behind the scenes of doing one of these big trades. Um, so if, if anyone in the crowd uh, is interested in seeing kind of behind behind the scenes at Alameda, check it out on YouTube. There's, uh, we have one more minute. So I have, I have one final question for you. You know, for those that are just entering the ecosystem or have been here for a while, is there one kind of tangible, tangible product or tool protocol that you um, have used recently that you'd recommend that the audience go in and try out? Oh, interesting question. Um, I, I would say, I mean, in general, if you're excited to learn more about the ecosystem, the easiest way is to use things. Like way better than reading about them is like put $10 in, right? Like put in something that you absolutely don't mind losing um, and just click around and see what happens. Um, I would say the core thing, absolutely use the top five blockchains, right? On each of the top five blockchains, try to like, you know, do the basic shit, right? And see what happens, right? Try, you know, try like getting a wallet and like sending things on the blockchain and seeing what happens and going through a centralized exchange using their DEXs, their borrow lending protocols. Um, definitely try at least one DEX and at least one borrow lending protocol because those are really central, um, you know, primitives in, in DeFi. It matters less which one that you use than that you use at least one of each um, to you know get to know them, see how they work. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I think that's like really the core things that I would say. Um, and then I think like it's maybe instructive to check out a few of the DeFi games, um, not because I think you're going to have a great time playing them, because I think you're not going to have a great time playing them. And I think it will teach you something about why DeFi gaming um, hasn't gone mainstream yet. Well, Sam, I think that's all we have time for. I just want to thank you so much for, for joining us today. And um, of course. Awesome. Happy Mother's Day. You too. <laughs> all right. <laughs> See ya. See ya.